Hello and welcome to the February edition of First Look ETF. I'm Stephanie Stanton with ETF Guide. It is great to have you with us. Coming up on today's show, $1.2 trillion predicted to be spent on electric vehicle development and production over the next seven years. We'll tell you about a new ETF that's moving full speed ahead in this massive market. Plus, we'll examine a new hedge fund tracking ETF that aims to provide sophisticated investment strategies for all investors. And finally, we jump into a new actively managed ETF that's partnering with an NBA superstar. But first, let's dive into a quick recap of new ETF launches. We've got Douglas Jonas from the New York Stock Exchange joining us now. Hi, Douglas. It's great to see you. Hi, Stephanie. It's great to be back. All right, let's start with an update on the latest numbers. Yeah, I mean, January was very busy here at the New York Stock Exchange. 21 new ETFs launched this past month with $514 million in new cash flow. And guess what? Our trend continues yet again this year with actively managed funds leading the way. 90% of all launches year to date are actively managed. We are coming up on, we're going to hit 1,000 actively managed ETFs here in the U.S., but total, when we look at the big picture, there's now over 3,000 ETFs listed in the U.S. with $7 trillion in assets under management. We talked about it a lot all through last year. You know, $620 billion in net cash flow into ETFs, while mutual funds saw outflows of almost $1 trillion. This year, I think it's going to be record-setting yet again. We had $40 billion in net cash flow come into ETFs just in January, so we're really excited. Wow. Yeah, those are very impressive numbers, Douglas, you know, especially, too, with all the um, inflationary pressure going on, talks of recession. Um, let's talk about mutual fund to ETF conversions, because that has been one of the important trends that we've talked about a lot on our show. What type of conversion activity are you expecting this year? Yeah, I mean, the idea that you would take a traditional mutual fund converted straight into an ETF for many years was sort of talked about like this holy grail. But a couple of years ago, it happened. It happened here at the New York Stock Exchange, the first conversions, you know, actually here in this building. And you're right, 38 funds have so far converted directly from their structure right into an ETF with $56 billion in initial cash flow. What's great news, though, they continue to grow. There's now $63 billion in those funds. The pipeline has never been stronger. There are 15 mutual funds that have been announced planning to convert directly into an ETF, more coming that have not announced. So if you're out there and you're watching and you're thinking, hey, I I'm interested, please contact anyone, whether it be me directly or anyone on, on my team, you can find us, uh, just type in New York Stock Exchange ETFs, it's not hard to find. All right, impressive as always. Douglas, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you. We will see you next time. Thanks. I look forward to seeing the total and big picture of this show for this month. Yes, we have uh, some great guests coming up. But before we send you off, just a quick reminder that you can now watch First Look ETF on Amazon Fire TV and Roku. Be sure to check us out there. Also, we simulcast on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, and other major podcasting platforms. So you can never miss an episode. Through the year 2030, analysts expect an estimated $1.2 trillion to be spent on developing and producing EVs. That includes everything from mining and refining raw materials to manufacturing the batteries. That means huge investment dollars will be needed to supply the necessary raw materials to address the lopsided supply demand balance of this massive energy expansion. Well, joining us to discuss a new ETF that's right in the middle of all of it is Will McDonough, CEO and lead portfolio manager at EMG Advisors. Hi, Will. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right, let's start with the investing strategy used by the Charge ETF, and your ticker there is CHRG. The fund is actively managed, but what else makes it a unique investment opportunity? You know, th this whole thing was birthed because I went into the market looking for exactly this product for my own personal investments. Um, I looked out at the biggest global macro story right now, the biggest macroeconomic story right now is the green expansion, and I appreciate that you use that term. Uh, we believe it's not a transition from oil and gas to electric and battery. It's actually an expansion of sources from which we get energy in our future is solar and wind. And, you know, batteries are a key component of that and the connectivity of that. And so I went out into the market to look at how I could get exposure to this growth and didn't find anything I liked. You know, I found a bunch of miners that in essence were startups that have no proven track record of extracting these metals or manufacturing these metals. 
I found a very concentrated supply chain. So a lot of the uh, names that I could have invested in were Chinese listed um, you know, equities that I don't have a lot of transparency into. And then I found the EV landscape to be equally troubling with startups like Rivian and Lucid and companies that are putting out hundreds of cars a quarter and in essence are startups. And so while we all know that energy is headed in this direction and we all see the massive amounts of money allocated from global governments towards carbon neutrality um, and just this you know, guaranteed outcome that we all expect or you know, hope for, uh, people really haven't spent the time to understand where is all of this coming from. And so when you look at the core elements necessary to build a battery, it's lithium, it's nickel, it's cobalt. And when you look at the demand for copper connecting those batteries to all of these energy sources and all of these uses, charging stations, all of the above, um, these are the four core elements that we think are imperative to a battery future and that we don't think that the world has, has necessarily figured out you know how in demand those are and how volatile the supply chains for those are yeah absolutely i mean raw materials are critical in all of this and i love how you phrased it as an expansion a lot of people see these different sectors of the energy industry competing but i love how you you know sort of see the integration of it all. Let's talk about the holdings in CHRG. How many holdings does the fund have and what are some of the top positions? Yeah, and that's also what's unique about our product is we are entirely futures contracts of the core metals, right? And so if you look at any competing ETFs purporting to give exposure to EV adoption or, or green energy, they have equities holdings of the aforementioned, you know, what we think are startups. Um, when you look at what we do, we have actually seven holdings right now, and the only reason for that is because we have four different lithium contracts out over June, July, August, and September. And the other holdings are May contracts for the price of nickel, cobalt, and copper, um, which are significant and um, you know we think uh, an appropriate allocation to fully participate in that adoption curve. You know, if you look out at where, like I say, these these metals are coming from, that's an issue in itself. But just you know, the, the, the finite supplies uh, that are coming out of China, that are coming out of Africa, that are coming out of Peru and Chile, you, know, you start to realize that at any given moment, you know, we could lose massive percentages of supply and those futures contracts will be the purest way to participate in that upside without any of the execution risk that you get at a company level you know, exposed to the geographies that they're in, exposed to the companies and you know, their capacities to get um, licensing, their capacities to get funding, they have a lot of obstacles to success, whereas the futures contracts are pure and direct. Yeah, and you know, you talked about sort of the volatility based on the supply of these metals, these countries in which they come from. Do you see that in the future easing up, you know, as, as more people get more streamlined in extracting these metals, or do you see that continuing? I hope so, you know, just as a, a citizen. I hope to see us with more sources from which to get this. But you know, the scary truth is that the Chinese over the last decade have gone out and accumulated literally the majority of the supply and literally the majority of the manufacturing capacity of these metals. And so we as an economy are completely dependent on relations with China and geographic access to China. Uh, without even discussing whether or not self-consumption of China becomes an issue and they start saying, you know what, we're going to keep this stuff for ourselves. Um, there is a lot of talks and there is a lot of investments directly into U.S. assets that have proven reserves, but those are 8 to 12 years from production. So this is a much bigger issue than investors have really thought through and, and that's why we think our product you know, should have a good run here. Yeah, and as you mentioned, a lot of geopolitical factors uh playing into that as well. Really quickly before we go, how do you envision investors and financial advisors using CHRG inside a diversified portfolio? Well, it's hard to meet anyone that doesn't have an allocation to energy in their portfolio. And it's hard to expect that anyone that has an allocation to energy doesn't have exposure to the four core elements that we have in our portfolios. And so we deserve an equal weighting to USO or oil allocation because the future of green technologies requires our elements just like the futures of you know, uh, internal combustion engines required oil and gas. And we all saw what happened with fixed supplies coming from the Middle East and Russia 
and um, you know, rising demands to the price of oil over the last 10 or 20 years, we predict that same activity in lithium, nickel, cobalt, and copper. Will McDonough, thank you so much for your time. It's great having you with us. Thank you. Despite industry-wide assets approaching nearly $5 trillion, hedge funds are still off limits for many investors. That's because many don't meet minimum net worth and income requirements. But now there's a new ETF that aims to bring sophisticated investment strategies to every investor. It's a hedge fund tracking ETF from Unlimited Funds. And here to discuss it is Bob Elliott, co-founder, CEO, and CIO of Unlimited Funds. Hi, Bob. It's great to have you with us. Thanks for having me. So the Unlimited Hedge Fund Multi-Strategy Return Tracker ETF, and the ticker there is HFND, Hedge fund uses a unique approach that attempts to provide hedge fund like access for both advisors and retail investors. Can you explain more about this? Our goal is to bring uh, a a product to market that allows the everyday investor to gain access to the type of sophisticated investment strategies that typically are only available to the largest institutions in the world. And instead of directly, directly investing in hedge fund style strategies, What we do is we've developed a technology that allows us to look over the shoulder of hedge fund managers, see what they're doing and what is driving their returns in close to real time, and then take that understanding and put it into the package of an ETF, which of course is the best uh, investment structure for the everyday investor. And so our goal is is to bring the world of hedge fund investing to everyone and to do it at a much more reasonable cost structure than the typical two and 20 products that are available to most investors. So that sounds like an interesting concept, one that many people might wanna get behind. Um, How many holdings does HFND contain and what are some of the top positions? HFND primarily uh, holds a range of 50 to 55 of the largest, most liquid markets in the world. They're all the names that you probably know uh, if you're an index investor in ETFs. products from Vanguard, iShares, et cetera, that are the sort of products that cover commodities, currencies, uh, credit, fixed income, uh, and stock sectors and geographies. At any one time, uh, the fund will hold probably somewhere closer to 20 to 30, which are the largest uh, exposures or the more significant drivers of hedge fund returns at any point in time. Today, what we see is most hedge fund investors are playing this this, uh, current uncertainty uh, by holding relatively low risk positions. They're valuing uh, value stocks over growth, uh, as well as looking at sort of top of the capital structure type credit exposures and moderate bond exposures. And I think the other thing that's very interesting about what they're positioning for is a rising inflation environment by being long uh, industrial commodities, uh, gold and agricultural commodities, which may not be positions that investors are typically holding in their portfolio. So with that being said, then, how do you see HFND being used by investors and financial advisors inside of their diversified portfolio, short term and long term? Most advisors we talk to are looking for alternative assets for uh, their clients. They're trying to find uh, those sorts of products that can add diversification and good risk return characteristics to a typical 60-40 portfolio. They often run into a lot of challenges doing that because those products are often illiquid or put in structures that are tax inefficient or require a lot of paperwork. And so when we talk to advisors, they really see the opportunity for HFND to get that diversified alternatives exposure into their portfolio in a much more efficient structure, whether it's from a tax perspective or uh, not needing to do all the paperwork you typically need in a two and 20 type portfolio. And Bob, really quickly before we go, what has been the response by some of your clients? Are they are they excited about this, that they get to sort of run with the big guys, if you will, the hedge fund managers? Yeah, I think many of our uh, of the advisors that we talk to see how uh, the positions and the way that HFND is 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 uh, the securities that they're holding the exposures in HFND aligned with some of the things that they read in the press from the most sophisticated asset managers in the world. And so they really see the advantage of getting access to that 
in the ETF structure, since the vast majority of them recognize ETFs are the way in which we're going in the future. And so to be able to get this type of exposure in that package, uh, they find really advantageous and compelling. All right, Bob Elliott, thank you so much for sharing more about HFND. We appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. The ETF market for funds with environmental, social, and governance strategies is one of the fastest growing investment categories. And besides doing good for society and the planet, investors also demand ESG strategies from proven firms. One firm front and center in this trend is also teaming up with a major sports star to further its investment offerings. Well, here to discuss all of this and more is Matt Kaufman, head of ETFs at Calamos Investments. Hi, Matt. It's great to have you with us. Stephanie, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. So your firm's roots go back 50 years, so it's pretty fair to say that you have a lot of management experience behind you. Let's start with your new ETF ticker, SROI. Now, it uses a proprietary ESG rating system to screen and select portfolio companies. Tell us a little bit more about the fund and what makes it unique. Thanks again for having us. Appreciate you uh, having us on the show. We're really excited to have SROI in the market. You know, from my perspective, this is one of the most growth-focused, sustainable equities ETFs in the marketplace right now. It's based on one of the longest-running ESG programs in the nation, SROI, which stands for Sustainable Return on Investment. It's an actively managed ETF. It's run by three long-standing ESG fund managers who've been managing ESG portfolios since the late 90s. Um, during that time, our PMs were instrumental in really helping set the standards for many of today's ESG funds. You know, as far as the rating system uh, goes, it's really focused on identifying growth-oriented companies that are also deemed responsible and engaged, which to us, that really includes those people and those companies focused on ecological limits, stewardship, and corporate governance practices, just to name a few. Um, our view is that companies leading in these areas are often also those companies demonstrating the qualities of innovation and leadership, you know, which we think really creates a distinct competitive advantage and the potential for long-term value over time. So I thought this was pretty interesting. SROI is also part of a broader partnership with an NBA superstar. I'm going to leave the name pronunciation to you, but you guys have committed to donating a portion of profits to charity. What else should investors know about this exciting partnership and who is the NBA star? Stephanie, I mean, who better to drive awareness to financial literacy and education than Giannis Antetokounmpo? You know, Calamos and Giannis have formed a 50-50 joint venture to build not just this ETF, but a series of funds, a mutual fund, a use its fund, and this global sustainable equities ETF. It, to me, this partnership marks one of the first times an asset manager and professional athlete of this caliber have teamed together as co-owners in this type of effort. And then, like you said, in addition to the investment products, the JV is committed to donating a portion of its profits to charities that reinforce the themes of financial literacy and education. Yeah, and it is unique, as you said, partnering up with an NBA star. Do you think that we're gonna to continue to see this trend happening, not just with you guys, but maybe other companies kind of copying you? I think we could see that. You know, I think, yeah, Calmos really set the stage for um, the potential to do that type of offering going forward and partnering with folks of uh, Giannis's caliber. And we're thrilled with the partnership, could not be happier with uh, partnering with him. And we're excited to see where it goes, but. Certainly, you know, a perfect person to drive awareness for, for these types of charities. I think it's great. So then how do you see advisors and investors using SROI inside a diversified portfolio? Yeah, from a product perspective, this is one of the more growth-oriented ESG ETFs in the marketplace. Um, the objective is, to, is outperformance over the S&P 500 over, over time. So along these lines, you know, we really think it can serve well as an equity allocation for investors looking for above average returns with potentially lower volatility, coming from a portfolio of high quality, growth oriented, sustainably principled companies. All right, well, it sounds very exciting. A lot of good stuff going on there at Calamos. Thank you so much, Matt Kaufman. It is great to have you with us here on First Look ETF. And that does it for today's episode of the show. If you enjoyed watching us, tell us in the comments section below and by hitting the like button. 
Before we go, we want to give a special thanks to all of our guests, as well as Douglas Jonas from the New York Stock Exchange. To learn more, be sure to check out homeofetfs.com. I'm Stephanie Stanton with ETF Guide. As always, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.